podcast is ready. ready. I wanted to add an extra emphasis yeah, to you, we ready. We should have so rehearsed this. put a this. little pause yeah, in there. Yeah, we should have rehearsed this. You didn't let me know that that's what we're doing, so you just derailed the whole intro. How we're really bad at rehearsing yeah, things. Yeah, we don't. There's no time there for rehearsal, no rehearsal here, y'all. You know just this. Just do it live. Just Screw do it live. It. Nobody just, cares. Nah. No, honestly, nobody cares. I mean, I you say like that. I feel like they want us to mess up. I think they honestly watch in hopes that something will mess up. Yeah. And they'll be like, ha-ha, I, I was there when you messed that up, Zach. Yeah, because they just like to rub it in your face. Forever. They do. For. Ever. What a way to intro the show. Hello, everybody. How hey, are you doing? Welcome going? to week seven <laughs> of Camp Social Distance. <laughs> that still Distance. says 6.5. Uh, that's, oh, man. That's my bad. Update that's that That's my thing. bad. Uh, oh, dude. Hope you're all having an amazing Monday. Hope you all had a fantastic weekend. I had a really good time doing a rewatch of Infinity War and Endgame because yeah. it was the one-year anniversary. I had a good time working on other things while you were watching. And just and, suffering. And just hearing it in the background and just being reminded of how... Just what an achievement that movie was. Yeah, and at one point you even stopped and you're like, oh, I, I should be working. Oh, oh, I'm like, oh, that's on. a There's Sunday. a moment. There's a moment. There's a very clearly a moment that happens that I don't care who you are and what you're doing. You're like, oh, I, I got to I gotta stop. I got to watch this. <laughs> I got to watch this. It was this. too good. Yeah. It was well, I mean, it's the, it's the hammer moment. It is, of course. Come it's on. It's the hammer moment. Speaking of the hammer, yeah. after all that hype for, How for years. How can you not? Yeah. No matter what you're doing, you drop everything. And you go for it. It tickles you in all the right places. Exactly. Right. You, had, you just had goosebumps right everywhere. I remember. Yeah, yeah, I know. I showed you. I was like, oh, I got goosebumps. Yeah, it's crazy. I goosebumps. Hope you guys are enjoying the the slightly reworked schedule. We did start with survival skills with Malika. She mm-hmm. cooked. She did fish fry, which uh, you guys had at your wedding. Uh, we'll be enjoying that hopefully after the show. Should be very delicious. After this, we'll be doing board gaming at two o'clock. That's right. Dungeon We're, mayhem. Dungeon mayhem. I'm gonna win. Okay, well, you lost on Friday, and you said you were going to win, so... <laughs> that didn't count. Yeah, whatever. Four o'clock, we're doing Space Camp with Lucas. He'll be beaming in from his house. He'll be doing more Animal Crossing. Kolok style. Kolok He's style. building Phobos in, oh, on his island. there you go. That'll be a lot of fun. That'll be interesting. Yeah, and then at six o'clock, we're doing dinner and a movie, and tonight's movie is... Sorry to Bother You, which I'm so pumped that I was able to sneak in some... Uh, some absurd, some absurd mood. I I love it so much. It's so good. Yeah. And I'm I'm kind of worried for our poor little hearts. Uh, so many people in our community are not going to be ready for certain <laughs> things that happen in that movie. But It'll I be a good it. time though. I love it. Uh, I can't wait. Some other movies we're watching this week. Tomorrow was my pick, Pan's Labyrinth. Wednesday, Book Smart. Thursday, Onward. And Friday, It Comes at Night. It's gonna be a any great. excuse to watch. It comes at night one on yeah, Friday. Yeah, baby. Wow. Any excuse to watch a good A24 flick is. Dude, uh, that movie's great. It's great. I know. So good. I'm very very excited. Very very excited. Uh, but we also have some new choices for today that oh, the chat can vote for. Oh, do we have some new choices? For. I we wonder do. what those might These be. These are yours. Number one pick, Old Boy, which is streaming on Shutter. The 2003 the South original, Korean version. The original. Yes. Uh, the Chaser, streaming on Hulu. And I Saw the Devil on Hoopla. Hoopla, which is the library. If you have a library account, it's free. Oh, So okay. if you have, like, yeah. I think I've told this story, but I watched the. I tried watching the Josh Brolin version of Old Boy, and I could not get into it, and it kind of jaded my, my Ooh, excitement to I'm watch so the sorry. original. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. So we'll, we'll, we'll palate cleanse that one next week. If we have if time we later to. today, we'll watch the trailers, or yeah. even after the uh, our very special interview, we might watch the trailers because... The trailer for I Saw the Devil yeah. is mwah. <laughs> such a good trailer. And the movie's really great. But out of those three movies, I don't know which one to pick because yeah. I love all three of them equally. They, and they all fit in the same range of like South Korean mm-hmm. crime ultra violence genre. Like there's some ultra violence in those movies. Yeah. Every one of them is really, really dark, mm-hmm. very hard to watch at times, like cr- cringe violence. Yeah. You know, like, ooh. So it's going to be a great time is what you're saying. I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait. Oh, my God. Look I'm at this. I'm getting handed food. Do you want to talk about our very special interview I today? Dude, I do. I – I'm very excited about wow. this. I did everything I could to not freak out about this. I've been talking about this for three days. What do you mean you've been trying not to freak out? About Shut up, Zach. Don't ruin <laughs> this moment for me, okay? Uh, I'm very excited to have our guest here today, the VP of Production and Development mm-hmm, at mm-hmm. Blumhouse. He's also a co-producer on Happy Death Day, Happy Death Day to You, Halloween, oh, Halloween fuck, Kills, yeah. Halloween Ends, basically any movie that Blumhouse has put, Man, has put I, out in the last few years. I love Happy years. Death Day so much. Me too. Such a good movie. Me three. Maybe and we'll get to ask about that. Ends twos. <laughs> Ryan Turk is here hey. from Blumhouse Productions. Thank you so much for being here. What's up? Hey. Welcome. Oh, hey. Thanks for having me on. Uh, this is a good time. Um, a good way to spend Monday afternoon here in Los Angeles. <laughs> Just with two idiots on the internet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, we're all we're all locked away. I mean, we got to find ways to entertain ourselves. Yeah, we're all idiots on the internet right now. Yeah, well, you know, it is. We, we're Everyone. doing the best that we can do. Mm-hmm. Uh, but thank you so much for being here. I really, really appreciate this. Uh, I was telling Zach that, you know, one of the things that, like, I found very interesting about your story was – you kind of come from the same worlds that we're involved in. You know, you started mm-hmm. out being a blogger, 
And then, um, well, you initially had come to LA. I, I remember reading you really wanted to be a screenwriter. Was one of the yes. big things. Yeah. Um, but then you sort of evolved in all that sort of stuff, which I which I thought was really really interesting. Um, but before we get into that conversation, how have you been? How are you doing? How are you? What's th what's this work at home life been like for you? Uh, at first, you know, I got <laughs> it's a great question to start out with. <laughs> um, I'm doing well. Uh, I always find ways to entertain myself, I and mean, we're all nerds. So, as you can imagine, my office is filled with uh, plenty of nerdery to check out. Um, when I get bored, I usually flip open a, a an old issue of Fangoria magazine and check things out. Um, but uh, yeah, work has been incredibly busy, believe it or not. Um, the at first it was kind of like a little bit of shell shock of we're all working from home and how is this going to work. And, all of our meetings that we had to take uh, over the, you know, from the the lockdown onward, we had to schedule and Zoom has become our best friend. Mm -hmm. But um, we're using a lot of this time at Blumhouse to develop and make all of the projects that we were supposed to have going into production even better. Nice. Um, you know, weekly, weekly pre-production meetings uh, with a lot of our filmmakers um and just doing a lot of reading and the good news is is that this is just a great time for filmmakers to kind of really dig in and uh noodle with ideas that they have and write new specs and you know play around with those ideas they had in the drawer that they probably just threw in there because they got too busy with something else so we're encouraging film now to really just reach deep and find scary stories to tell so what's yours <laughs> my scary story what's what's your what's your uh what's your spec idea that's been sitting in a drawer that you're now getting to fledge out <laughs> you know the funny thing is it's funny <laughs> you say that i found um because it, it, it coincidentally uh strangely enough we, we moved before uh this all happened and when you move you generally find old boxes that you haven't rifled through in a while and i found <laughs> a uh, a box full of floppy disks. Whoa! And, wow. Um, so I had a, I went to Amazon and I bought a floppy drive for my Mac. <laughs> they, and they must have been like, I "Who the hell is ordering this?" <laughs> I know. Yeah. And, and I and I went through some of those floppy disks and I found old scripts that I wrote when I first moved out here to LA. Wow. Um, one was called uh, Education, which was basically Scream meets Dawn of the Dead. Um, another one was, uh, fuck, I think it was called like, either Neighbors or Subdivision, but it was basically Last House on the Left in a small neighborhood where it was the entire neighborhood rises up against these three bullies that had been torturing them for like ages. Hell yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and I, you know, and I, and I, and I look at them and I cringe <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, and I occasionally think, uh, what the fuck, but, um, <laughs> anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to swear, but, uh, no, no, you're good. Good. Yeah, good. That's, you're okay, fine. okay. 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 Um, but yeah, that's the, the, uh, you know, once I get final draft on, on my computer, I'm going to bust those babies up and, uh, just open them up so I can, because when I open them, it, it like pulled up some old DOS pro program or something like wow. that. Wow! So like the <laughs> formatting was all messed up. So I need final draft on this computer so I can actually read. Oh them God, on. that's crazy! Uh, final draft script yeah. save on a floppy disk. Wow, that's, that's nice. awesome. Yeah. That's that, crazy. But did you, I think there might be promise for education. I, I don't know, guys. There yeah. might be promise there. <laughs> have you have you found that it's uh, been easy or? pretty challenging to adapt to a work from home setting when you're because you guys are kind of in the middle of like pre-producing and in the production of several things at once does that make it more complicated or no actually i think working from home makes it a lot easier uh, as a matter of fact um it you know it is interesting to uh kind of quantify how much time you actually spend in your car driving to meetings yeah and all you need to do is just open up zoom and talk to director x or actress Y or whomever that you have a meeting with uh, and they can just hop on Zoom and the quality of the conversation is still there. Um, so I'm getting a lot more done. Um, and also, dude, I mean, like you guys know this, I worked from home for like seven, eight years running shocktdrop.com. So I know how to adjust yeah. in terms of working from home. It, it, it's smooth. Make sure you put on pants every once in a while. You know, eat a bowl of ice cream for lunch if you have it. And, oh yeah, uh, I got some peanut. I got some peanut butter in the freezer right <laughs> Me now. Me too. <laughs> peanut butter ice cream. I'm not it's gonna be peanut butter night in the movie, baby. Yeah. It's gonna be so good. <laughs> let's let's actually go back a little bit because I'd love to know a little bit more about you know you you moved to Los Angeles in in the late '90s. I think it was like '99, 
and you came yeah. out to pursue screenwriting. What, why screenwriting? And was there a particular medium you were trying to go for, whether it was like short films, features, or television? And was there a particular genre other than horror? Was it just mostly horror? Um, well, the funny thing, so when I, I went to film school in Manhattan. I went to SVA, the School of Visual Arts. Um, and around 96, uh, late 96, it kind of solidified um, my place in the world of horror. And I mean, I'd always grown up a genre fan and I was always a horror fanatic. Um, but one of the great stories I love telling is that I, I skipped out on my homecoming. I literally took a date to homecoming and then I left because the new issue of Fangoria was waiting for me at home. And so I just kind of, it was a dick move. This is so relatable, um, it hurts. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> it, was a, it was a dick move, it was a dick move, but, um, but I know I was much wait, happier. Wait. You, said it, you say it's a dick move, is that because you had a date? I did, I did. So I did you, you bailed on the date. Okay, yeah, total <laughs> dick move. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, <laughs> bailed on the date. Um, but late 96 is when uh, Wes Craven's Scream came out. And that movie was such a form, like such a formative thing. It was a, a fresh new screenwriter named Kevin Williamson, um, and he just had a voice. And it was some, it, I don't know, that was like a weird beacon for me, where it was like you can have a career in horror. Horror will always survive. Horror will always be relevant. Um, and so from that point on, I was like, that's that's what I want to do. I don't want to work in any other genre. I don't want to do dramas or comedies or anything like that. I want to do horror. So when I moved out here um, in 99, um, you know, I started writing spec screenplays, feature screenplays. And I, you know, I did all the things that, you know, a fledgling screenwriter, you know, does. They, you know, you look up in the classifieds like screenwriting hangouts and, you know, you go to the universal lot and you go take courses on, on screenwriting. And one of the first things that, uh, one of the first things that I did, uh, I was working at a post-production company and a guy said hey dick wolf the television veteran is doing this new show with brian dennehy r.i.p um and uh he's doing this new show called arrest and trial uh and he's looking for writers and so i wrote a 30 minute episode of arrest and trial and put words in brian dennehy's mouth like Damn. i wrote the narration for it and i was like this is so cool I got paid a hundred bucks. But... <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> but, <laughs> Holy <yeah>. shit. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're like, so the, you want to know the even funnier thing about it? I mean, it was like such a, like a, like, I don't know, just a, a goofy move on my half, my behalf. Because I remember being so psyched. I didn't quite process what this guy was saying when he was like, dude, you get paid like 800 bucks. And I was like, 800 bucks, man, that's amazing. No, he said a hundred bucks <laughs> and like, oh, oh, got shit it, got, it, got it got it yeah but it was around that i mean like you know the screenwriting is a very frustrating thing and and some people have the patience for it and yeah. i just didn't have the patience for it i liked i liked writing and getting instant gratification out of it so that's mm -hmm. where i i just started segueing into writing for the internet and, and writing reviews and interviewing people nice so you you mentioned scream and i'm sure halloween also obviously obviously very important film to you as well but was there anything uh prior to those movies like growing up that really stuck out to you that you were like oh man this is a genre that i love and i want to in some way contribute something to it yeah i i you know when i was in high school um i think it was around the time bram stoker's dracula came out mm. and that was a pretty pivotal movie uh, for me in my formative years but at that time when that film came out i was segue I was, I was moving from junior to senior year in high school and had to like kind of make that decision of where you're going to go to school where you go to college and what do you want to be yeah and so that summer between junior and senior year uh the art institute of pittsburgh was having summer courses for uh, special makeup effects. And I said, oh, maybe I want to do special makeup effects. So my parents took me to Pittsburgh and for the summer I spent, uh, that summer I just kind of spent time uh, sculpting and doing, make, trying my hand at makeup effects. Um, and that seemed like that was gonna be my decision um, until senior year started and my, um, my art class started introducing film to it, like, you know, camera and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I started playing around with that. And I said, no, maybe I'll just like kind of get in as a director, writer, director. And that's when I kind of shifted gears and chose SVA as my college. Wow. Dang, that's crazy. So <clears throat> once you came to LA, I'm sure it was probably a few years before you started or helped co-found Dread Central and Shock Till You Drop. 
what were you hoping to do or looking to do to like really add maybe like a new voice to horror or some new flavor to online reporting in that genre in particular? Um, I didn't really look at it that way. That way. I just kind of just jumped into it. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, you know, message boards, message boards were long before Twitter and, and, and just as vitriolic. Um, but that's where I was kind of just putting like little news bites on, like, cause I would go to conventions out here and I would hear things and then I'd race to the message board and be like, yo, I just heard Stuart Gordon is going to be doing this new movie. And, and, and it took, um, this guy who ran this website called Crypto Corner to, uh, to pay attention. Um, and I just wanted to write about stuff. Like I was writing reviews about, you know, the Vincent, uh, Vincent Price, Roger Corman, AIP, uh, Edgar Allan Poe movies that he were doing, Pit and the Pendulum, you know, stuff like that. Uh, actually, I was like looking at old, uh, old reviews the other day on the way back machine. <laughs> Cause I had, some of, some of those pages are still up there on your corner. Uh-huh. Um, and you know, I just wanted to just tell it like it is. And, 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 and obviously, you know, once you make anything that you love, you know, once you make any hobby that you love a piece of business and your income, then other things start to play factors. Like when I ran Shut Up Till You Drop, suddenly it became necessary for me to cover the Twilight movies because that meant more ad revenue and da da da. And it was like that started grinding on me um, to the point where it became less fun. Mm-hmm. Every, I think around the point. When I worked for Fangoria, that was probably the best time of my life doing the journalism thing. Running Shock Till You Drop was certainly fun, but it just became incredibly, you know, it wore down my soul a little bit. And I was writing news articles like every hour because you got to boost the boost the traffic and keep all that shit going. Um, so around year six or seven is when I started looking for other things to do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I started podcasting. I started doing on camera stuff. Um, and then that's when I started uh, kind of putting myself out there as a uh, producer and, and trying to find projects. And, 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 and that kind of got inspired um, by the fact that Craig Perry, who is a producer on the Final Destination movies, wrote to me one time and said, dude, so you wrote a review of the script for Final Destination 2 before like, we even went into production. Not, but we, re- we read your review of it and we actually took your notes. And I went, oh, <laughs> okay. <cool." laughs> um, now I, I did the same thing for House of the Thousand, not House of the Thousand Corpses. I did the same thing for Devil's Rejects. Um, I can readily say that Rob Zombie did not reach out and say, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but but that's when I learned. I was like, wow, uh, the, you know, maybe the voice that I have um, can do some good and maybe shape the the horror genre and push it into new areas and and, and you know help it grow. Yeah, I I think, that's that's my hope. <laughs> well, I think that's like that's like a challenge that that we run into all the time is like we love making videos and talking about things that we're passionate about, whether it's superhero stuff or you know niche genres or even particular stu- like we love talking about like a twenty four. You know, we lo- you love talking about Asian cinema and all that sort of mm-hmm. stuff. But yeah. it it is it is like it is very taxing to constantly have to like. Okay, what does the YouTube algorithm want today? What what yeah. what does Ugh. it want me to feed it? And Ugh. after a while, you're just kind of like, <laughs> Barf. I don't. This is not what I want to like. I want to talk about it, and yeah. I just want to be able to passionately articulate why something means so much to me. And I don't. It's not necessarily. I don't want to just do it for the views. I don't don't want to do just for the the likes and the reshares. Like I just want to passionately put myself out there. And yeah. I know, like you know, nowadays it's become harder and harder because there's just such a greater volume of people out there doing that. And yeah, yeah. I, I think it's like. Once it gets to that point where you're just chasing a number and you're not really like yeah. accumulating a community of people who are equally passionate about the same thing, I can imagine that that becomes pretty taxing. You're saying that yeah. because it's pretty taxing on you. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> fucking taxing on me. There's only yeah, so many the things thing. I can say about Captain America Civil War without sounding like a broken record. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's the thing. I mean, like the nerds won. We won. Yeah. We yeah. got exactly to the, into the positions that we wanted to. We yeah. won. We took our hobbies and our loves for cinema and our loves for comic, for comic books, and we turn it into our careers. So we won. We just need to make peace with the fact that it's fucking hard. Yeah. You know? and, 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 and I say that, you know, now, obviously, it's, it's so many people are losing their jobs today and, 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 and filing for unemployment. So, you know, like that's a that's very small complaint on my behalf, you know, in terms of, you know, all, you know, the fact that 
uh, we got to turn what we like doing into something that we love. Um, but you know, it, it's just the nature of the beast, I guess. Yeah. I mean, something that I read that I thought was really very relatable. Uh, it was actually an interview with Dread Central and you talked about how your love for horror movies was kind of challenged and tested and you actually moved out of LA at a certain point. And you, yeah. you said you spent a couple of years trying to kind of like figure out, okay, mm. what is my next step? What do I want to do? I think like yeah. we've all kind of been there. I know I've definitely did that. I got, I was in visual effects and after we finished Avengers, they like let up, let go, like pretty much the whole staff. And I was like, yeah. all right, well maybe I'm going to go back to San Diego and rethink my life and see what I want to do. What, what was, what do you think was one of the most valuable things you learned about yourself and your passion that convinced you that, okay, going back to LA is the right idea but my approach has mm. to be different. Yeah, I think um, I think LA came at me fast, and I was uh, I was kind of under you know I was kind of having a little bit of I was experiencing some panic in terms of where my career was going, and so and I was in a another relationship at the time, and so it was very easy just to I, I remember I had like a little bit of a nervous breakdown where I was like I just need to get out of here, and in spite of every single friend. Uh, that I had made in the horror community. Like, I literally had them rally at my house, and they're like, where are you going? Like, why are you doing this? So I moved to um, I moved to Traverse City, Michigan, which is about the farthest fucking destination you can go. I mean, like, if you look at Michigan, it's yeah. like <laughs> up here. Um, and, and so I did that, and the goal was just to create my own business. I, I wanted to get into the haunted attraction business. I wanted to open haunted okay. houses. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm in. And I'm I, into it. <laughs> yeah, and I was I was well versed in it as well and and I did my research and I had ideas and I had a sketchbook I like to draw, you know, I used to like to draw. And um and so I was like, okay, two things. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to go to this town. I'm going to be a horror host and I'm going to have my own public access show. And I'm going to introduce like weird old horror movies like Sven Gulli and Elvira and all that shit. And I'm going to open a haunted attraction. But then reality hit me as soon as I got up there. And I was like, oh, fire codes, insurance, like, <laughs> zoning, zoning, zoning codes. Um, not let me put this like, weird, creepy house on this plot of land next to somebody's farm. What? They don't want to do that. Um, <laughs> so, so while I was trying to figure out an escape plan, um, I, I, I segued into the world of broadcast journalism and I was a news producer for an NBC affiliate. So I was producing the six and 11 o'clock news on a weekly basis. Nice. Um, and then, and then around that time, I was like, what, the, what am I doing? Um, go back to LA. Luckily, a lot of people who, uh, who, who, who were very supportive and really close friends, you know, they would, they would touch base with me every once in a while. And around that time, I was just like, the website i was still doing horror website stuff um but you know it just it just dawned on me that i need to go back my brain is refreshed i'm kind of hitting a reset button i kind of went through some tough stuff up while i was up there and um i just did it like i just dropped everything on the credit card and just got the hell out of dodge and just came back here and once i came back here i had a little bit more clearer focus what i wanted to do with the website what i wanted to do in the horror journalism career um, and I was working for Fangoria and Remorg. And so there was a lot of great things happening at that time. That was like 2005. Wow. Yeah. I like, I've, I've had a lot of those moments where I'm like, mm, do, at what point do I finally just pull the plug and just go, you know what? I need a two year break and I need to go yeah. somewhere on like a secluded Island and rethink everything. Uh, it's but, scary. I mean, like yeah. look, any kind of, any kind of, but you know, sometimes you just need to burn it all down Yeah. You know, and, and really just jump right in and listen, like, I was like squatting. I would like when I lived up there, like I got gotten out of that relationship and I was like squatting in somebody's house, like an empty house, trying to like figure out my escape plan back to Los Angeles. So, you know, it was like those were really tough times squatting in a house and playing a lot of Resident Evil 4. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so at one point after all this has happened, you you were asked to join Jason Blum for the press tour of The Purge, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was um, basically uh, Universal had called me uh -huh. um, and they said, hey, why don't you come and take a look at this movie we have? We don't really know what to do with it, um, but we're going to invite one journalist to come check it out. Uh, we want it to be you. So I went to Universal a lot and I sat down for The Purge and I came back out and I was like, whoa, like that movie is like, that's going to light shit up. Like, yeah. That is incendiary and it's, and it's potent and it's fun and it's, it's like a kind of a, a ferocious uh 
Twilight Zone episode. And so they're like, okay, great. Then you come out and you're going to tour with Jason. You're going to get some content for your website. And you're going to be the MC of all the college tour we're doing. And that's when I got to meet Jason for the first time. Mm. And, um, and it was, it was a lot of fun. He picked my brain. I picked his, you know, in terms of the business. And I, I just used that as an opportunity to learn more about uh, a business I wanted to get further into. Was there anything in particular that he told you or you guys discussed that really attracted you to the idea of working at a place like Blumhouse? Or was that kind of something, was that part of like one of your goals was, okay, I want to find a company that really suits the things that I'm passionate about. Oh, uh, this company Blumhouse that did th- is doing these movies and just did this movie seems like it would be a really good fit for me. Yeah, well, they were they were taking a lot of risks on filmmakers like Rob Zombie, who they did Lords of Salem together. Um, they were looking for just really con- strong, conceptually driven ideas, which we still do at, at Blumhouse. But I just like that they were taking risks on low budget horror movies and somehow making them incredibly commercial, um, but also being a little bit subversive in their own way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they, were, they they had a lot of success with Paranormal Activity. Um, and they were doing just like a lot of cool stuff with a lot of great filmmakers. And I just like Jason's attitude, you know, he just had a great attitude about it. Yeah. I, I was, I didn't know that I knew Blumhouse before I knew Blumhouse because I had seen Paranormal Normal Activity, but I hadn't like put all the dots I think together. all of us were in that boat. Yeah. It kind of like, it felt like overnight they became a household name mm-hmm. for, and you're like, where? But it was just, and then you look at the catalog and you're like, oh my God, they're stacked. Yeah. yeah. It's like everything that I enjoy horror genre that's yeah. coming out into theaters, they have a hand in. Yeah. And you don't even realize until all of a sudden it's just like a switch goes off and you're like, oh shit, these guys are, they're, they're doing they're everything. crushing it. Yeah. yeah. I know we talk about it a lot, but I think the big thing, and like, okay, we don't have the real numbers to like support this, but this is just like what we read. But we talk about like, man, how the hell were they able to take such a small amount of I mean, small compared to other movies, you know, how are they able to take that much amount of money and put so much like bam for your buck on the screen? I think that's probably like one of the most impressive things. Anytime I watch one of Blumhouse, one of the Blumhouse movies is you don't like you feel like it's a multi-million dollar, you mm-hmm. know, like you feel like there's a lot of money behind it. Not that there isn't, but like compared, oh, compared to a lot to of the, other movies, know, like, are Blum- you kidding me? Blum- <laughs> is, yeah, doing so well with the, regards to profit margins yeah. coming out of the theaters. It's it's wild. Like we saw Invisible Man and I'm like, dude, these visual effects are Holy so shit. fucking good. I know. That, I know. that movie I blew know. me away yeah. to, to realize that it's like, you yeah. know. I, I just wasn't expecting it to be as tight and fluid and, and just so like it, it, you would never know. Oh, a Blum Blumhouse movie like and and that's also cool to see how just through the the cultural appreciation of Blumhouse like there was a time where it's like Blumhouse oh Paranormal Activity you know it's yeah. gonna be a little bit more grimy low budget you'll feel that low budget like now I don't feel like you could pick out out of the lineup and I know it's been like that for a while but I yeah. think we're all starting to understand like they're they're making movies at a quality that. Uh, I don't think anybody 10 years ago would have expected. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I know going into Invisible Man, for example, you know, I didn't really know what the, what the take was going to be on this, on this, on this, on this remake. And I was like, man, they went really tech with this. Yeah. Holy shit. I was not expecting that, you know, because I mean, you, you look at, um, you know, some of the other stuff that, that Universal's tried to do with that monster verse and I, I just looked at this movie and I was like, dude, this is like a really cool approach. If going forward, if this MonsterVerse, you know, tries to utilize more of this like tech and like very modern uh, take on all this stuff, I thought it was super impressive. And the same thing for Halloween. And I mean, I know the original was made for, you know, I think like 300,000, 325,000 back in the day. And it was a pretty profitable movie back then. But, you know, you would think in 2020, mm-hmm. all right, it's a Halloween movie. It's got Jamie Lee Curtis and it's got John Carpenter as a producer on it. And so we got to put a lot of money behind it. But like, from, at least from what I read, it was more than usual Blum- Blumhouse movies, mm-hmm. but it still isn't like, you know, some crazy amount. So I think that's like, I think it's one super impressive. And I think it just shows how like resourceful you guys are with just trying yeah. to make the best possible quality. It, it, I mean, it's, it's kind of got that still has like that indie filmmaking. Oh, it does. And I it. think something that I've really been enjoying lately is it's starting to feel kind of like the A24 of horror where there's like an autoristic, fi- like Invisible Man felt like, touristic in a way like there were some choices mm-hmm. some great <clears throat> choices that were made in that movie from just a shot sound design cinematography you know and to the point where you're like wh- where, when did this all start happening you know <laughs> and then and then you look at the library and you're like oh there's a lot of movies that have been doing this yeah. you know and 
it makes me excited because I feel like it's going to encourage more and more filmmakers to start taking those chances and those, you know, in the horror genre in that mm-hmm. regard. Because there's, it's really confident filmmaking, like really confident. Yeah. And I mean, the fact that you guys can do something like The Invisible Man and Happy Death Day was a movie that, and I will be totally honest, I had, I had not seen a trailer, so I had no idea that it was even out in theaters. We were at TwitchCon mm-hmm. in Long Beach, mm-hmm. and it was a super hot day, and a couple of friends of, uh, and, uh, and I were like, well, let's just go to the movies. Let's like ditch the con for the day. Let's go to the movies. What's playing? Oh, there's Happy Death Day at 4. I kind of know about this movie. Let's go watch it. We walked out of that theater. We're like, holy shit, this just became my favorite movie. Like, it was <laughs> so damn good. And then the sequel comes out, and it's like a complete different almost genre. You went from like horror to like horror slash fantasy. Is that something that you guys really try to look for when you're developing something new? You know, what's the new take? What's the new spin on it? I mean, you basically took Groundhog's Day, made it a horror movie, but then you did it again, but you did a more fantasy take. Are you guys always kind of thinking like, how can we mix genres in an interesting way? No, I mean, the way, you know, we really look for is director experience and and, and a director is we're very much led by the director's vision and you know obviously it begins with the director and then whatever they want to bring to us um with happy death day chris we had always been trying to find other things to do with chris landon because he had a heavy involvement in the paranormal activity franchise um and he had sent jason and i a copy of happy death day um and you know it was just that flipping the final girl trope on its head and then putting a final girl through a groundhog day scenario i was like okay this isn't as this isn't as scary as i want it to be but it definitely it is that kind of way into the slasher formula that i've been looking for yeah Yeah. that really turned that turns it because ever since scream came out um you know everybody under the sun just said okay great you know let's do a slasher film but it's got to be tongue-in-cheek and I'm like, no, not every slasher movie needs to be fucking tongue in cheek. And I, and I continue to look for that, that straight, slash, scary slasher movie. But Happy Death Day really just turned the thing on, on its head. And when you talk about the kind of pivot, the genre pivot from Hall- uh, Happy Death Day to Happy Death Day 2, you know, Chris, uh, Chris always had that in his head, I believe. And, and when I read it, I was like, oh, man, you just, it, you know, it felt like the combination of three really strong 80s sci-fi movies that I love, <laughs> uh, Real Genius, um, uh, My Science Project, and Weird Science. You know, it was like that so that weird science trifecta. And I was like, that definitely, and he was leaning more into the comedy, but because Chris had proven himself on Happy Death Day, we felt confident that he can really turn Happy Death Day to you into something spectacular. And I, I think that movie, is, seeing the two movies, as a double feature is an absolute delight. Oh, as you yeah. Get all the little little pieces, and little in-jokes, and all the threads that he puts together are just so much fun. But, but to, answer one, to answer your question, it's really about director and what that director position is. And Invisible Man, you know, that's the testament to Lee, man, Lee Bonnell, and, 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 and our team that's uh, in physical production, and Bea Sakira, who is my colleague, uh, another executive here, um, you know, they, 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 every movie is just a collaboration and with a director kind of leading a charge and, and they just did such a great job with it. I, I, I too, I was there for, you know, giving notes on Invisible Man, but I had the, the kind of good fortune to, to wait until like a rough cut came in to actually see it. I didn't read or watch any dailies. I just kind of like stood back while I worked on other things. So watching that first cut, I was just like, oh my God, this is what it is. This is amazing. Yeah. So, and I'm very excited to see um, Karin Kusama's doing a, a Dracula for us. So that's, that's where we're- Fucking where we're awesome. <laughs> that's <laughs> rad. I know, I know, I know. Yeah, she came in and she's like, I want to do Dracula. And we're like, okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> oh. Sign right here. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I think that's what, that's what excites me because again, you know, like I was really looking forward to that, to the MonsterVerse that previously, you know, Universal was kind of trying to build out. And, you know, that, that went the way that it did. <clears throat> but then now hearing, you know, you guys are doing Invisible Man, Dracula and stuff. I'm like, oh my God, Blumhouse, is, is, is this potentially going to happen? Is this going to be like the start of something? Even if it's not interconnected, <laughs> I don't need it to be. Yeah. If it is, that's like great. But if it's not, I'm just like, <laughs> I'm just excited to see these things <laughs> yeah. just come to fruition. Because I think those are like, those are such staples of Universal. And I think, you know, yeah. getting new universal modern... disappointment, <laughs> <laughs> I think getting like new uh, takes on those things would be really, really cool. Yeah, so I'm, I mean, I'm like it, it's, 
Yeah, I mean, like, look, we've seen horror goes in cycles. Yeah. Horror goes in waves. Sometimes there, and it goes in peaks and valleys. Sometimes <laughs> there's a great, great run of horror movies through through the years, and sometimes there's some real duds. And we yeah. saw a lot of duds in the '90s. Although I, I I I I can argue that there are a lot of great films that came out of the uh, '90s. But um, you know, but all it takes is like a a scream or Danny Boyle taking the zombie subgenre, yeah, and yeah. that into something you know. Twenty eight days later, you know, and I'm still waiting. That that's the stuff that like when you read it and it just clicks and you just go, yes, that is how you that's how you tackle the Invisible Man in 2020. Mm-hmm. That's how you tackle. I mean, like I, we haven't read anything from Karen is still working on her her Dracula, so I have no idea what's coming um but i can imagine it's gonna be amazing but that's that's the stuff i mean like it, 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 you know when when a vampire film comes in or or a zombie film comes in i do look at it with a little bit more of a, a little bit more scrutiny yeah knowing knowing where the zombie and vampire genres have been and and how you know it's like okay how do you push these genres forward how do you get an, an audience excited about those again mm. and so you know I, I always keep my ear to the ground and hope for hope for someone to like really reinvent them would you say that that's primarily how you guys will develop a movie is it with a director that comes to you and says hey this is something i really love to make or do you also just kind of get scripts that writers send in and that you then have to like try to find a director for yeah it's both it's the process i mean like it's a little bit more director coming to us and saying this is what i really want to do or this is something i'd like to develop um but you know there are movies like ma um, that came through, uh, began as a pitch to me uh, from Scotty Landis, um, who had written a, a spec script um, that was kind of like a little slasher movie set in a hotel. And I really liked his voice and I brought him in. Scotty sat down and he's like, look, even though you didn't like this script, I've got an idea for this movie, um, kind of based on a little bit like on my, on my up, growing up. Uh, where there was this weird guy that always bought us booze and he would hang out at our parties, <laughs> but he didn't like cross any, he didn't cross any lines, but he was just weird. Yeah. And we were like, and I, and I said, you know what? That is a, that's a relatable concept that, is, <laughs> that, that has a, uh, a lot of potential for something scary. Go write it. And he wrote it and came back and when, and, and it was Ma. And when he wrote, uh, when, when the script came in, um, you know, one of our executives, Cooper Samuelson, uh, slipped it to Tate Taylor, and Tate Taylor came back to us and said, "I want to do this, and I want to bring my friend Octavia Spencer along for the ride." And that's the best outcome. That's you're like, outcome. you're like, I'll, I'll sign right here. Yeah, Thank yeah, you yeah, very yeah. much. Yeah, yeah. That's, oh that's, yeah, that's sure. Go ahead, bring her. <laughs> yeah, no big deal. That's yeah. It's fine. Yeah. So yeah. once <clears throat> once you're once you've kind of made this connection with with Jason, um, and then you know at some point you finally like accept this role, this this new job of being the VP of development uh, at, at Blumhouse. You know, I know you said in, in this article that you were terrified of taking this role because, I mean, it's like, it's an executive role, right? You yeah. know, you go from like writing, it's like you go from writing in, on horror websites and all this stuff and doing film production, but then it's like, hey, you're going to be in charge of helping us develop movies. <laughs> what is that first day like? Um, How terrifying I, is it? When you, when, you, when you encapsulate it like that, I feel like a lot of my decisions in life are a lot of just like not thinking about it and just diving in and yeah. hoping for the best. Um, <laughs> But yeah, this this was a this was a pretty big uh, life decision because that meant not working from the from the the comfort of my home. I had <laughs> I was living very comfortably at that point. Like I could wake up, update the site. I knew what my day to day was. So when my first day began at, uh, at Blumhouse, um, well, I'll take you to the to the day I got hired. When I got hired, I went in, and Jason was like, "Buddy, you're hired." Uh, you know, start making preparation, go have somebody else run the website. And, um, <laughs> and, I, and I walked into the parking lot and I ran into Lee Wanell. And I'd known Lee because I had interviewed him so many times, like on the Saw films and whatnot. And Lee's like, oh, hey, mate, how's it going? And I was like, hey, I just, uh, weird, I just got hired by Blumhouse. And he goes, oh, cool, you're going to do some website stuff? And I'm like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to develop movies with, 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 with them. And he goes, shit who's going to champion our movies now who's going to write good reviews <laughs> and i was like well i'm sorry lee i mean i can do it from the other side now. i can i can i can help you get a movie made um so so day one day one i mean like they just threw me in the office gave me my my lot my office line i had my laptop with me and what i did is i just uh i caught up on everything i had in development 
wow. like everything that was that was I had I was reading everything I was watching um watching some of the films they had in post-production and I kind of just jumped in and, and started giving notes um and then over time you know I I started I started gaining enough experience and, and getting acclimated enough that uh they started putting me on set and, and being the producer to watch over things on set and so it just meant more just more responsibility um but that did that the first day man i was just like man i hope my dog's okay my dog is so used <laughs> to being by himself i mean being, being me being there uh i hope he's being taken care of and i, I, I was very very crazy it was weird wow so so you would say that getting acclimated the <laughs> toughest part about that was just like the lifestyle change really Big time, big time. And I was such an idiot too. I mean, like I walked in in like a fucking like pant, like like slacks and a button up shirt and a tie. And I, and like, I would sit in the meetings that first week, every meeting and everybody's like, this fucking guy wearing a suit, like a tie. Like, because I just didn't know. I was just like, maybe I need to dress up better. And then I realized, no, I can literally walk in here with jeans and a t-shirt and be, be okay. Yeah. So, oh man, I was such a nerd. And then I got, and then, and then, and then three days in, uh, three days in, I got um, incredibly sick. Um, mm. And I remember going to a Sony meeting. Um, I remember going to a Sony meeting where they were showing us a, a list of films to look at, uh, to remake. This was like, you know, five years ago now. And I remember sitting there going, looking at the list and all of a sudden I was like, I, I have to vomit. Like I am physically ill. And I was like going, yeah, yeah, Candyman would be cool. Uh, uh, Life Force, no, that's not a good idea. That was a weird, cool movie, though. Um, and then it would kind of wrapped up me. And then I ran to the Sony executive back and I just <laughs> grew up. I was just, I was so sick. Oh, man. That was day three. That was day three, guys. Oh, jeez. Thank, uh, thank God you were able to hold it in throughout the meeting, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just going through all these lists, you're like, oh, my God, I just want to get through this shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was, I, that, was, that was crazy. I was like, oh, my God, I hope they don't fire me. <laughs> so then, so once, once you're in that new position, you mentioned that, you know, at a certain point, they start letting you go on sets to kind of oversee yeah. productions. When you're both the, the VP of production and development, and you eventually, you know, are now a, a co-producer in a lot of these projects, where does one role end, the other one start, or are they constantly overlapping kind of based on what's going on at the company? I'm sorry, I repeat the question. Sorry, I, my, our publicist was talking me on the side. Oh, it's all sorry. good, it's all good. <laughs> Balancing work in, guys, sorry, what was that? It's all good. <laughs> when, you, when, when you have kind of like, when, you're, when your role is the VP of production development, but you're also yeah. now co-producing stuff and you're being yes. on set, yeah. um, where does one job end and the other begin or is it constantly overlapping? It's all overlapping. It's all overlapping. Like, you know, on Halloween 2018, you know, my entire time there is uh, not just making sure that the day to day is going smoothly and, and making sure the filmmaker is getting what he wants and the crew is happy and all these other things. But I'm also on other meetings like I'm on development meetings and I'm, 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 I'm like and the, the crew would laugh at me because every Monday morning we have our big staff meeting where we're going through everything that we have and just getting updates and giving updates. And it, the crew would always laugh because we were on the East Coast. So that meant by uh, 1130 in the afternoon, Ryan would disappear for two hours and they wouldn't see me because I'd have to go away and go hop on a phone call. And then I'd come back and uh, the, the, the meetings are very long. So I'd come back just exhausted. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's a juggling. It's a lot of juggling and it's a lot of reading and it's a lot of meetings and phone calls. It's, it's a lot. It's a, but it's a lot of fun. I mean, like, look, there are no complaints. I mean, it can get stressful like anything else. I mean, I've had um, I've had moments where I've stayed awake all night because I could not sleep um, because I thought I fucked up so bad. Um, and that was, I'll give you insight that had to do with a Black Sabbath project and Sharon Osbourne. Um, yeah, yeah. I had I, I was I, I had the luxury of uh, working on a project with them, and I thought I messed up so bad, and I had got a phone call from Sharon, and I could not sleep. I didn't. Yeah. Sleep. Oh man, uh, that's, that's that's always by, by tough. The, by the morning, by the morning, but by, by the morning, it was like, oh no, it's all okay. And I was yeah. like, oh, of I, course. I think everyone has that story about coming into the industry fresh because everyone started somewhere. I don't feel yeah. like, especially with the film industry, there is no handbook. 
You know, there's no, like, go to this no. website and learn how to yeah. do your job. Sign up to be a producer. Yeah, wow. yeah. It, it doesn't work like that. And I, I'll never forget coming out from the Midwest with years of experience in a small city. Yeah. And then being like, I'm ready for L.A. And the fir- my first day on a major production on set, I got yelled at. I uh, I had the <laughs> cinematographer pull me aside and be like, dude, I'm going to fucking fire you if you don't get your shit together. And it was just like that immediate slap in the uh. face of, like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Yeah. Oh my god! Just shut up! Yeah. Just shut up and watch! Just shut up and listen! Don't <laughs> just keep my mouth shut! Yeah. Don't do anything! Just listen! And I, I think it's important for people to realize on the outside that everyone goes through that. Yeah. yeah. That it's yeah. like every single person had to have that moment of like, my career is over. I'm done. I'm for never sure. going to recover from this. Yeah. It's all yeah. just a part of those well, building blocks and learning. And I was going to say, what was amazing too was that there was room for, there was room for growth and room for learning because Jason knew. Who he was hiring. Jason hired me because I, I am the dyed in the wool horror fanatic who's got this crazy, weird encyclopedic brain for horror facts and horror, you know, horror mm-hmm. filmmaking. And he knew I didn't have the experience. He knew I wasn't executive. And so when he hired me, he took all of that into account. And he was a he is a, he continues to be a great mentor. Um, you know, even on projects that you know some major projects I'm on over here, he'll. He lets me take off with them, but at the same time, he you know, walks in and if there's something that where I took a misstep or something, he's like, he'll he'll pull me aside. He'll be like, buddy, okay, now I understand why you made that decision, but for next time, understand this. And he gets that. It's really really cool. And he, you know, I've, I've been there for five, going on you know by this November six years, and he he still has that openness about him where he knows that every experience um where i'm not like kind of well versed in something he knows it's new and i'm kind of learning as i go so i you know i i'd like to think i'm i'm a more experienced than i definitely was one year ago two years ago three years ago but uh like you said there's no playbook for this stuff you know and when a giant freaking ip comes in yeah for a property and you're like oh, i love that that's going to come with its a whole new set of challenges yeah mm-hmm. that halloween did not have that spawn doesn't have that you know uh um, the purge movies don't have every single movie is a different kind of beast and they and you just gotta take them on that's awesome it sounds like you've got a hell of a cool situation there too i think the number one thing everyone dreams of is having that kind of mentor in the yeah. industry to help guide through and using their experiences to help you grow it's yeah. it's such a like it's super important I super think. important yeah. thing in this industry for sure yeah. yeah yeah so you talking about jason talking about halloween so <laughs> He he. I know he said that. I read. I read at least that he you know he credits you with being such a big component of Halloween really working the way it did and the success mm. for it. Why was Halloween so important for you and for for you guys to acquire Blumhouse? And what did you? What was your intention with acquiring? Like, what did you want to do with it that you thought, okay, if I'm gonna if I'm going to really like put my neck out there for this franchise, here's what I think would really really work for it and reinvigorate it. <laughs> um. Well, Halloween was always that kind of uh, seminal horror movie for me, um, you know, for myriad reasons. I've talked about it so many different times yeah. on, on different things. I mean, like, I mean, you're wearing the Halloween shirt, man. I've got like four, <laughs> five shirts in my closet that I could wear on any given day. But yeah, but, I have too many, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, like in terms of how important it was for us to to get it, you know, it was always something that I, I tracked and and. And I, it was always like one of those wish lists. It was like, man, wouldn't it be cool if we just got the Halloween movie and we just forgot everything else, everything else about it, and just brought it back to its roots and just made it super scary, you know? I mean, I, I, I thought the Rob Zombie movies were fine, um, but they are, they're incredibly aggressive and their own sort of beast. Let's, what, what would happen if we brought John back to the fold, all these people back to the fold? Um, so I didn't have a clear idea of what to do. I just knew the feeling I wanted uh, from putting it together. I knew the feel. I knew the feeling that I wanted, which was classic and scary. Mm-hmm. And 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 then once we got the director, going back to what we say, you know, about uh, being director led, you know, it was David DGG. He came in into into this, and he he knew he was saying all the right things. Mm-hmm. And then when and then when he said, uh, I want I want Danny to write this with me, I was like, oh, dude, Danny who? Danny who? And he goes, Danny McBride. And I was like, ha ha, you're kidding. And he goes, <laughs> nah, man, he's a huge horror fan. And it was the second meeting we had uh, where Danny flew out and sat down with us. 
that uh, I realized Danny could talk horror movies as much as like he he can he he's on par with us. That's yeah. awesome. Um, you know, he was dropping. He he slyly dropped a Jason Goes to Hell reference, and I was the only one in the room who caught it. <laughs> and and I said, and I just stopped the meeting, and I said, I got that reference. And he was like, Yes, <laughs> he, was, he was super happy. He was super happy. But it was just you know, it was just really trying to just really reinvigorate it and bring it back to the fold. And and also you know, from my time on working at Fangoria, you know, I always took this one piece of information with me, which was Tony Timpone, who is my editor. Um, he always said to me, Ryan, whenever we put Michael Myers on the cover of Fangoria, it is a sellout issue and we don't have any more left in the warehouse. <laughs> Michael Myers has some sort of weird power over people that people immediately gravitate to it and, and, the, and there's a curiosity and a weird, a weird morbid curiosity yeah. and a fear that comes with that. So the dude is like the image of Michael and like that, that mythology is super, super powerful and, and we can keep going with it. I first discovered Halloween watching it. I think it was like AMC had like the horror nights <clears throat> yeah. uh, in October. I remember watching on TV for the first time and I'm like, I keep catching this movie like an hour into it. And I don't know how I got away with this, but I had a um, morning teacher in my elementary school. I was nine. And I, and I started talking to her about Halloween and like my fascination with the movie. I'm sure she was probably freaked out because she's like, "You're nine. Why the hell are you watching this?" She yeah. let me borrow it on VHS, <laughs> and my mom somehow said yes to this, and That's I watched amazing. it. And ever since then, I've been like terrified. I for like eight years or out of my life, I was like terrified to have a closet door open. But for some reason, you're right. There's something about that character. You see the yeah. mask, and you're just like it like sucks you in. I don't know what yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah, and it's like it, oh, sorry, my dogs are going crazy. Um, and it's and on top of that, beyond Michael, it's also Jamie. Uh, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis is Laurie. So Stowe. good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that has that has its own power too, and she represents so much. Yeah, for sure. So we are we are running. Hey, we got about a few more minutes left. So I have sure. I have more questions, but I'm gonna. Ask he probably you, wrote a hundred. And look, you know. <laughs> this is the only chance I'll probably get to do this. So let me have my moment. No. So uh, was there ever any consideration of? for you guys to ever shoot in South Pasadena again for, for these new movies? No. no. Um, just simply because of, uh, you know, us trying to uh, keep the budget low. Sure. Um, and keep, I mean, obviously you were right. You know, it's not as low as some, Halloween wasn't as low as some of our other movies, but it was definitely in terms of a kind of a franchise movie. Yeah. It was definitely, it was definitely uh, budget conscious yeah and and you can't make a budget conscious movie um in los angeles at least at the time we were doing it yeah um, it would have been too tough and obviously david david gordon green and danny mcbride are from south carolina and it just made sense to make it out there and 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 obviously they had a great tax tax incentive yeah i remember when i read the article that david gordon green and danny mcbride were doing halloween i was like look i love pineapple express what the fuck is this movie gonna be and then i saw the movie <laughs> and i was like oh shit i was way wrong this movie's great i love this yeah. movie so much yeah, yeah. And where where were you guys in the process of Halloween Kills when all of this stuff happened? Um, where were we on Halloween Kills? Oh, we had locked picture. Uh, we were we locked picture a couple of weeks, uh, probably a week before we went into lockdown. Locking mm -hmm. picture means that there are no more changes uh, being made in the edit process. Maybe a little tweak here and there, but in terms of the kind of narrative. Uh, construction of it we were all happy producers were happy everybody was happy so we have a picture where we have a movie we're happy with and now we're at the stage of uh mixing and 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 sound design and vfx and stuff like that and very mild when i say vfx everybody's like no yeah um, of course no very, very every mild. movie has vfx you know, now yeah, every yeah, movie yeah, exactly. does come on exactly just clean up so yeah. that's where we're at and 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 um and i'm happy to say that i i watched a cut of the film with John's score last week. Ooh. Oh, 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 shit. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. John, John has been very, very busy in, the, in these isolation times. Yeah. Um, but it is, it is, oh, I, it's so mm. good. It's so good. Has, so do you, I don't know if you can answer this question or not, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, has what's been happening affected the post-production process or are you all able to kind of work from, from home and finish the movie? No, no, it's put a halt to some processes of, of the, you know, post-production. Mm -hmm. But um, for anybody who's listening to this and kind of freaking out, don't worry, we have plenty of time. Um, you know, it sounds like there will be parts of the industry that might be opening up this summer. You know, there's a kind of like a hard deadline where, uh, that we need to meet and we've got, we've got time to do it. So mm -hmm. we yeah. just want to make sure everybody's super safe and sound and, um, you know, nobody needs to be in a 
in a, on a mixing stage when they don't need to be. Right. It sounds like a lot of aspects of pre-production can be done yeah. in the middle of all this, but post-production yeah. can be a lot tougher because a lot of people don't have the rigs at home that it takes yes. to, to do this kind of work. Yeah. Yeah. And luckily, luckily Tim Alverson, who is our editor, uh, he is just a, he's a magician. And so he's able to make any like little tweaks and stuff like that. And even up till the other day, he was texting me about, uh, some changes and stuff like that. But again, it, it, it's all good. We're, we're in a great place. The movie is fantastic. Um, wait till you hear the theme. Oh man. Oh man. I want to go to uh, sleep to that theme. God yeah, damn. Yeah. 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 It's cool. That tingles it's your jingles. Cool. Oh, it does it? tingle my yeah. jingles. I listen to, I listen to that music way too much. It's yeah, probably not healthy, time. but whatever. Is there, is there, is there any property? I know you've talked about Friday the 13th a lot, but is there any other property that you would love to bring to Blumhouse? Um, yeah, Friday the 13th is definitely at the top of my list. <laughs> um, and, and continues to be, yeah. uh, I mean, look, it, it's Blumhouse, not, not Turek house. Yeah. Um, but, you know, <laughs> but. If, I, if I had my, if I had my brothers and, uh, and I had carte blanche, I would want to do a splatterhouse movie. Okay. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's just, it's just dudes and masks that like <laughs> I, I super love. And, and I like the idea of this kid, this like weakling kid putting on a, what looks like a Jason ripoff mask. And yeah. becoming like a, basically the Hulk and taking out a haunted house full of bad guys. <laughs> just, you know, that's just one of those, one of those ones that I really like, but uh, you know, I mean like in terms of other properties, not especially, I mean like Friday, like I said, Friday the 13th, but that's just got so many things against it. right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we didn't even get a chance to talk about Slashback Video, but let everybody know, uh, you know, what, what this idea is and, yeah. and what the concept of it is, because I think it's really, really cool. Yeah, yeah. Spl uh, Splatterhouse. Uh, Slashback Video <laughs> is um, it's an immersive, uh, immersive experience that is at the Mystic Museum here in Burbank, California. Um, and it basically is a, uh, it's, an, it's an art installation and immersive experience that trans you, trans uh, transports you back to the 1980s when the mom and pop video oh, are you are you are you running that or did you help yeah, set that up yeah, oh fuck, yeah, that's yeah, awesome yeah, yeah. yeah, that's yeah really i that's... bought a couple pins from there oh great thank you yeah. um yeah that's uh my wife ciara and our, our partners kiko and eric over at the mystic museum we all came together to do this kind of it, it just began as like me going you know uh man kids don't know what it's like to be in a video store these days <laughs> like they all they do is go on apple t itunes and and they look at terrible posters on there and they yeah. gotta make their selection like why don't we just create like an immersive experience where you walk into an actual video store but it's all horror so it's everything everything is horror um but it's a time capsule but this mm -hmm. time um this time around uh we we created a narrative experience so you're actually going in and getting a little bit of a mythology to our, our, our icon uh, uh, tape head. So it's a, it's a lot of fun. We were open for three weeks until Mystic Museum had to get shut down due to COVID. But, um, but when they're up and running again, we'll be open and probably, and, and hopefully everybody can experience it again. I just wonder if it can go back to normal. Yeah. Please. And if, yeah, if for, those, have that, for those God that damn, don't I know, wish. <laughs> if you're in LA, uh, we talk a lot on this channel about magnolia boulevard and yeah. how <laughs> scared we are for it being hit by the yeah. virus because it's just so many great like old stores that are like small businesses um that are really like doing really cool shit like that all that whole strip has got so yeah. much cool stuff yeah. and mystic museum and the halloween stores and everything and there's a couple good comic book shops over there i really do hope they pull through this uh because it's some really really cool stuff you should yeah, check out for sure get a for sure well ryan Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for hanging out and talking with us, giving us so much knowledge. I feel inspired as hell, that's for sure. Um, really, really appreciate it, and I'm super excited to check out Halloween whenever it comes out. I I'll, I'll wait. I'm patient. I'm very patient. If you guys have to delay the movie, I will be there day one no matter when it comes out because well, that well, is my right bread now, and butter. We're, 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 right now, we're aiming for our release date. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I haven't heard otherwise, but fingers crossed. Everybody just needs to do their part so we can all enjoy nice things later this year. Absolutely. Thank, this, you, guys, thank you so much for that. Really yeah, this has been it. awesome. Hey, thank you. This has been absolutely yeah, great. Thank you so much for joining us. Everybody stick around. We're going to take a quick break just to reset some cables, and then we'll be right back for some board games. Thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.